This is a lecture for my seventh hour U.S. history class on the 23rd of March. Okay. Uh, we were talking about the fact yesterday, and be sure to watch that lecture today uh, from yesterday. But anyway, we were talking about the fact that uh, once the war was declared, this we debated the war. There were many votes in Congress against the war. Wilson led a divided nation in the war, but once the war number of the American people, maybe a majority of the American people, uh, became uh, convinced that all Americans ought to support the war. In other words, it's okay to debate the war before we go, but once the shooting starts, you support the war. That's it. Uh, and if you oppose the war, uh, if you won't uh, serve, uh, if you don't do your duty, then you're not a real red-blooded American. And if you're not a real red-blooded American, we're going to put you in jail uh, or we're going to deport you, ship you out of the country. And again, a lot of people were against this war. Uh, now, many German Americans fought in the United States Army, were loyal citizens, uh, but some went to Germany. Not very many, but some went to Germany. Even I think more went to Germany in World War II to fight in the German Army uh, in World War II. But uh, some Germans did. You had Irish Americans. Uh, you know, they didn't want to support England in any way because England still owned Ireland uh, and they wanted Ireland, Ireland to be independent. And they, many of them were praying for the Germans to win World War I. Uh, you had pacifist uh, Americans uh, who said they were opposed to war. You had isolationist Americans who said, uh, you know, we've done just fine. I've been isolated from the rest of the world all these years. Why in the world get involved in a European war? Why go 5,000 miles away to find a war to fight in? We're just fine. Uh, and then you had uh, Americans uh, who were progressives who said uh, every dime that we spend on building ships and guns and bombs and all these things to fight the war are just, it's just money that's taken away from making this country better. We have plenty of hungry. We have plenty of homeless and uneducated and ignorant here and the poor here. Uh, and uh, that money could be used to make America a better society. It's a waste. Uh, it's a waste to build, to spend that money building bombs uh, to kill our fellow humans. So all of those people were opposed to the war. And if you were opposed to the, now the majority of the American people support the war, but all of those people were opposed to the war. And if you opposed to the war, people looked at you and said, "Hey, this person just might not be a loyal American." As soon as the war is declared, get this down, uh, the Congress passed this law, the Espionage Act of 1917. And you don't have to write down the whole Espionage Act, but I would write down enough to get the gist of it because it becomes very important, the Espionage Act. <clears throat> and essentially what the Espionage Act says, as you can see, is a person could receive a $10,000 fine or 20 years in prison, okay, for interfering with the draft. If your neighbor gets drafted and you go over and you talk him out of it and say, don't go, this war isn't worth it, you could end up in prison for 20 years. Or encouraging disloyalty or uttering, printing, writing, or publishing any disloyal, profane, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States. In other words, it's saying don't criticize the government. How full would the jails be if every American who criticizes the government today was in jail? You have to think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, yeah. You don't have enough jails to hold all the people. Or if you criticize the form of government, you know, you know I mean, taken to its most extreme, this law could say if I got up and said, hey, I believe a democracy is better than a republic, I could be put in jail or fined $10,000. Uh, or criticizing the Constitution. Well, if I'd gotten up in 1917 and said, "Hey, I think women ought to vote," and I think it's, uh, I think the Constitution is lacking because it doesn't allow women to vote, we need to add an amendment to the Constitution. I could have criticizing the Constitution. Technically, I could have been put in jail, or the flag, or the uniform of the Army or the Navy. I could have, you know, in World War One, it's the first war that we go to olive green. You know, today the Army wears green. That's the first war that we uh, actually send our troops to combat in olive green, and it's remained that ever since. <laughs> Up until then, it had been blue. But uh, you know, now when you go in the Army today, when you get your dress uniform, it will be blue. It's the same uniform that the, it's your dress uniform. It's the same uniform that the Army's always had. But in combat, you know, or in going about your daily duties, uh, you wear a green uniform. Well, anyway, I, if I'd have said, look, I think those green uniforms are awful. You know, we ought to go back to the old blue. I would be criticizing the uniform of the, of the soldiers of the United States. 
and technically I could have been put in jail. Uh, or advocating, in other words, promoting the curtailment of production of anything necessary for the prosecution of the war. If you lead a strike out at an ammunition plant and the plant shuts down, you could be put in jail because you were curtailing something, uh, ammunition, that was uh, desperately needed to win the war. So uh, what do you think about this law? Is this uh, a violation of the Constitution? Yes. Yes. Specifically, which part? What? First Amendment. The First Amendment. How many? How many times does this law? How does many times does this law uh, abuse the First Amendment? At least once. What? At least once. I think more than one. Yeah, at least once. Yeah. Uh, uttering, printing, writing. What does uttering mean? It means to say. What? What do we call that? Same speech. Yeah, freedom of speech. Nine. The press. Nine. Freedom of the press. You can't hold a protest. Freedom of assembly. You know what the First Amendment says? It says that you have the right to assemble and to protest if you think the government's wrong. It violates that. There are five rights in the First Amendment. The only one it doesn't violate is what? Religion. Religion. Yeah, religion. Okay. By the way, this is anti. This is as anti First Amendment as it can possibly as it can possibly be. Uh, and of course, um, you know, you couldn't protest against the war. You couldn't uh, criticize the Constitution, uh, freedom, of the flag, uh, freedom of speech. And of course, uh, you know, to uh, sort of enforce this, get this down, uh, the government created a thing called the Committee for Public Safety. Okay, the committee. The Committee for Public Safety. The Committee for Public Safety. And it was headed by a man. Nobody remembers it. The, the, the Committee for Public Safety. But uh, nobody remembers it as that. It's uh, called the Creel Committee because a former muckraker named George Creel was appointed to head this committee. Okay? Former, uh, they were... Uh, he was appointed to head the Committee for Public Safety and, uh, write this down, Information, the Committee for Public Information. It's to promote the war. It's to promote patriotism and support for the war. The Committee for Public Information, that's better. Scratch safety, public information. I was thinking of something else. The Committee for Public Information is propaganda, and its purpose is to go out, to fan out across the country, and unite the Americans behind the war. Uh, and you know what? If this were 1917, I might be giving this lecture. And there might be a knock at the door and two gentlemen might come in, well-dressed gentlemen, and I would say, may I help you? And they would say, go right ahead with your lecture. And they would just go stand at the back of the room. And when the bell rang, they would say, all of you ladies, please leave. And they would come up to you two guys and they would say, how old are you? Uh, and uh, let's just say you would say, well, I'm 18. And they would say, can you produce your draft card? And if you couldn't, what? Jail. Well, you could. You could end up in jail. But they were going in high school classrooms, college classrooms, in baseball games during the seventh inning stretch. That's what they would do. All of a sudden, agents would just appear at every exit and go through the crowd. Uh, and everybody that was between 18 and 40, I think that maybe it was 18 and 45, but 18 and 40 probably, they would say, and if you couldn't show your draft card, you ran the risk. I'm not saying everybody was arrested every time. But a lot of people were. You were taken to jail. You'd be sitting in the movies, and all of a sudden the lights would come up and the movie would stop, and uh, down the aisles would come, just marching down these members of the Committee for Public Information uh, and others. And they, again, would check to make sure that you had, uh, you had registered for the draft. And if you had not, uh, you might be jailed, you might be fined, you might even be deported. Because the idea was this, all true blue, red-blooded Americans support the war. And if you don't, you are not a true blue, red-blooded American. Newspapers. This is a very intolerant age. You know, if, if you haven't written that word down, I talked about it yesterday, but this is an age of intolerance. Look, when people are afraid, they get intolerant after 9-11. Muslim mosques were vandalized by people because the, the men who had uh, flown the planes into the Twin Towers happened to be Muslims. Uh, 
Muslims were beaten up in this country. Uh, when, a night, when when people get afraid, and you know, there's not much more that spook. There's not there's not much that spooks people more than a war. Uh, all sorts of atrocities are carried out. This is an intolerant age. Intolerance means you, we all have to be the same. If you're different, we cannot accept that difference. We cannot accept that difference. Newspapers get this down. Talking about the First Amendment, freedom of the press. Newspapers uh, that oppose the war were shut down. Socialists were deported. Do you have the right to go down to McIntosh County Courthouse and register as a socialist? Yes. Yes, you do. Do you have the right to go down to McIntosh County Courthouse and register as a communist? Yes. You do. You think that's right? You don't? You can't register as a communist? I thought you could only register as like the whatever four parties are doing. Well, let me remove the mystery. Look right here. In Oklahoma, the law says you've got to register with a party. I know you all can't see that. Where is it? Right there. You can be a Democrat. You can be a Republican. You can be a Libertarian. You can be an Independent. And if you don't like any of those, you can form your own party. I suggest you all start a party, the three-day school week party. Yeah. Me and Turner are going to be the smart guy. Well, start a party. Can you do an existing party? Like, or not an existing party, but like one that would like. You say communism. You could be a communist. You okay. could be a socialist. Right. You could be an anarchist. What? So if you register for no party, whenever they're doing the primary election, yeah, you can't vote. Oh. Okay. Now, now, I, you know, if you lived in New York, where there's a communist party, and they nominate candidates and all that. You could once in a while, but not nearly as much. You know, in Oklahoma, more and more, even if you're, <laughs> if you're a Democrat, you know, you can't. I mean, the Democrats just, in many instances, choose not to run anybody, so they don't have any primary candidates. And if there'll be five Republican counselors or whatever, okay? So, yeah, good point, yeah. But you can make up your own party. Do you understand, in this great republic in which we live, do you understand if somebody can say to you, you cannot be a communist, they can tell me I can't be a Republican. You have the right to register in any party you wish. And I often tell people, if you don't, and I, I sort of like my party, the Republican Party, less and less these days. I've got this hope we'll come back. But I like them less and less, and they like me less and less. I'm getting to where I can't stand them, to tell you the truth. But anyway, uh, I'm thinking about registering in the, the Whig Party, just to re bring back the Whig Party. That's what Lincoln started as a, as, as a Whig, and he did okay. In fact, the Republican Party actually came from the Whig Party, but I can register as that or anything else that I want to. You're right. I'm not going to be voting in a lot of primaries in some of those, but still, if you can deny, if you can say, uh, you know, you can't register as socialist, you could tell somebody you can't register as a Democrat. And if I said that very loud in Oklahoma, people say, what's the difference? All Democrats are socialists. And that's insane too. But that's another topic for another day. Those socialist Democrats. Nancy Pelosi's a socialist. She's going to destroy America. Well, if she is, she's a rich, rich, rich socialist. You know, I don't know what she would be against capitalism for, which she's not. But anyway, the German language was no longer taught in schools and universities. German music was no longer played. And, and what German music am I talking about? Who are some great German composers? So let me just tell you why you're pondering that. All the great music was written 300 years ago. If you think 300 years from today, there are going to be people sitting around listening to somebody wearing a hat that six people could stand under, twanging on his guitar and singing about Ma ran off with the hired hand and Pa jumped down the well, you're sadly mistaken. But this music that I'm talking about is immortal, okay? So who are some great German composers? Um, mm. Mozart. Mozart was not. <laughs> what? I said Mozart. Mozart. That's that's one. What's another one? Yeah. Beethoven. Yeah. Beethoven. Yeah. Beethoven. Yeah. One of my favorite, Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach. World German? What in the world? I thought they were like Italian. No. 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 <laughs> You know, these guys compose music, Italian sing it. But anyway, yeah, uh, uh, Wagner, Wagner, okay, who's Hitler's favorite? Isn't that the one he went to the opera house? Like, mm -hmm. how many times did he see that? Oh, like 40 times or something? He would see it. Yeah. Mozart. 
They were all banned. You couldn't play that. In fact, the director of the Boston Symphony Orchestra was uh, conducting uh, a concert. And just before it started, uh, a government agent stepped up and told him, when the concert is over, you must play the national anthem. And he refused to do it. And they arrested him and put him in jail. Okay, and you know what that reminds me of? And I don't watch pro ball, and I don't give a hang about it, but this Colin Kaepernick, is that his name? You know, would not stand for the national anthem, and that caused quite a uh, stir in the country. You know, uh, there's nothing new about that. Yes. Why did he refuse? Who? The Whoever was at the Boston Symphony, like you just said. I don't know why he refused. He just said he would not play the, the national anthem. And I'm a big national anthem fan, and I stand, and I – you know, I believe in that, and I believe you should show, show due deference and respect to the flag. I think the flag symbolizes the great things that this country has achieved and what it's meant to the world. Uh, but if you ask me, do I have a right not to stand? You do. You have a right not to stand for the national anthem. There are people uh, that are, there's a religion, and some of you may be members of this religion, and they are called the Jehovah's Witnesses. You've heard of them and Jehovah's Witnesses will not salute a flag. They take the injunction in the Old Testament that you shouldn't have any graven images before you. you know, they take that to mean even a flag. So they don't fly flags. They don't participate in the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, and they don't stand for the national anthem. Uh, and that is absolutely their right. In 1942, 43, uh, there was a case that went before the Supreme Court there were a group of Jehovah's Witness children in a West Virginia school, I believe, and they would not stand up and salute the flag every morning. Uh, and they were put out of school for that, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, you can imagine how intensely uh, patriotism was flowing in this country in World War II. And the Supreme Court ruled that they had the right. They said you cannot force people to salute the flag. That's as un-American as it can be. And you know what they reference at the same time in Nazi Germany, uh, children were for forced. As Hitler called them now. <clears throat> Hello. The emergency from my tech support company. They can go hang themselves. But anyway, I hope you got that on the tape. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm gonna have to start kind of behaving myself now. I guess somewhat. No, I'm not. But anyway. <clears throat> In Nazi Germany, uh, children were forced to stand up, and, and not just children, but children were forced to stand up. And the Supreme Court said that's not the way we do it in the United States. And that was in 1943, when this country was more united. Patriotism was at a higher level than it had ever been before, or it has ever been. It has ever been since. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, government agents actually attended churches on Sunday morning, and if pastors got up and talked about war being evil or called Jesus the Prince of Peace, they could be arrested, okay? They could be arrested. No difference, no tolerance. We even changed the food in this country. You know, used to in this great and free republic, we used to have, uh, I think it was every Thursday, sauerkraut for lunch. And when you got to the school in the morning, you could smell sauerkraut. You know what that is? It's cabbage sauerkraut boiling. You could smell it, you know, a half a mile away. Uh, well, sour, of course, it came from Germany. German immigrants brought it here. Um, sauerkraut, they changed the name of that on school menus to Liberty Cabbage. Uh, and the hamburger. Don't laugh at these people. The, ha <laughs> the hamburger, okay? You oh, wait, that I mean? was, we went through that. The hamburger, it was named after that, like, port where they said it originated. Yes, um, Hamburg. Of, yeah. Hamburg, Germany. Hamburg, Germany. You know, yeah. all these German immigrants getting on the ship. And uh, where did you do that? Huh? Where did you get that? Uh, we, at our lunch table, were like, why is it called a hamburger? And we looked that up. No, like, we were arguing whether a hamburger was a sandwich. Yeah, a sandwich or not. It's well, burger. some guy in Germany sees all these, you know, well, you know, why not just have, you know, it, it's the original fast food. Just slap some meat between two pieces of bread, and people started calling it a hamburger. It was a hot dog. Huh? It's a hot dog a sandwich. Well, <laughs> that's a fine point of law that is a topic for another day. I don't have time. I'm trying to teach you about world. Then we can talk about if, if cereal's a soup, but you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Hamburgers 
were from Germany, so we couldn't have hamburgers. We kept making hamburgers, but we just changed the name. We called them Salisbury Steaks. Those are extra free. Dude. Yeah, Salisbury Steaks, <laughs> because Salisbury is, is, is you know, you've heard of the Stonehenge. Southern England is this great plain. It's called Salisbury. And, of course, we were fighting on the side of the British, and it was just fine to call something by a British name, the Salisbury State. Uh, don't laugh at these people because after 9-11, think about this, after 9-11, or maybe it was, no, I think it was after 9-11, uh, yeah, the French, the United States was going to uh, invade Af Afghanistan and uh, uh, Iraq, and uh, the French uh, objected to that. And I don't think they would let us use their airspace to fly planes, and so up in the Congress of the United States. They have the congressional cafeteria where senators and congressmen can go and eat. And they change the name of French fries on the menu to freedom fries. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for now, I think they've gone back to French fries, but now the, the French ticked us off. And so we call them freedom fries. So the more we change, the more we stay the same. Anyway, uh, and also get this down. Uh, there was a socialist uprising. A group of socialists uh, got together and said that they were going to overthrow the United States government. And by the way, it's the only socialist uprising in the history of the United States. And it took place in Oklahoma from about Norman to Eufaula. Okay, that's roughly it. By the way, our first state flag was that. Look at that. 46th state to come into the Union is red. That's socialist red. Uh, our state motto, our state motto, you know, socialists say we're for the working class. The working class is going to be abused, and so we're going to elevate the working class. And um, the uh, state motto of Oklahoma is labor omnia vincit. Let's put it up there. Labor, labor omnia, I hope I spelled that right, Vincent. What, what language is that? Latin. Latin. And it means labor conquers all. Labor conquers, the working class conquers all. So we had this red flag. We had this red flag, our first flag. Socialism was strong in Oklahoma. Six members of the state legislature were socialist. Well, if they elected a socialist to the state legislature today, they would blow the dome off the top of the Capitol. Uh, but six members of the state legislature were socialist. And there were socialist organizations. Now, you just can't imagine this in Oklahoma. Uh, there were socialist organizations in every county in Oklahoma. And during presidential elections, 20 to 40 percent of the population voted socialist. That's in Republican Oklahoma. And the message of the socialists was the working class must rule. Uh, they said socialist spokesmen gave speeches and they said the, great, the first socialist on earth was Jesus. They said he was a carpenter. He was a working man. And what did this carpenter, this working man do? According to the socialist, on one occasion he went into the temple and he chased the money changers out of the temple. I'd like to tell you that story from the secular view. But anyway, you know the story, right? the money changers in the temple. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Jesus chased them out uh, with a, with a knotted rope and kicked over their tables. Uh, the socialist said this, the socialist said this, these money changers represented wall street. That's like wall street today. They said the big banks, the wealthy, and they control America. The system is rigged against the working class. Uh, they also said this, get this down. A man, has a right, a natural right, they said, to own the land he worked. Uh, in Oklahoma and much of the South, there was a system called sharecropping. All right, write that down, sharecropping, or tenant farming. Lot tenant, tenant farming. And what happened was is that the large landowner would allow several families to come live he would provide them a house usually a shack to live in and he would allow them to come live on his farm and each one of them would farm a certain amount of land and the way they paid their rent is that they turned over two-thirds of the crop to him 
And I, you know, I could go on and on about sharecropping, but they worked. They turned over two thirds of the crop to him and they kept a third and they sold that and they bought all their necessities. And then the next year it started again and again. And they, they uh, worked that land sometimes in generations. Sometimes the father would die after years and the sons would take over and then the grandsons would take over. And you had families, I'm sure you could find in this country, not in Oklahoma, but I'm sure you could find down in the Delta of Mississippi, you could find families who have lived on the same piece of land for 150 years as sharecroppers. They worked the land, but they never owned it. And socialists said, if a man owns land, he ought to have the right to own it. And they call World War I this. Get this down. They call World War I this. They said it was a rich man's war and a poor man's fight, end quote. The socialists said the only reason the United States has got into this war is that before we got into the war, we loaned the British and the French a lot of money. And now it looks like in 1917, the Germans are going to win it. And if Germany wins, the United States will lose all that money that they have loaned to the uh, British and the French. And so that's why we're fighting. We're uh, fighting to secure those bank loans that the big bankers on Wall Street made. I'm just telling you what the socialists said. We're fighting to save those loans that the big bankers on Wall Street made to the British and the French. Um, and they said, that who's fighting in this war? The poor are dying to secure the loans of the rich. And so here's the solution. That's uh, the, the socialist complaint. Here's the solution. Get this down. Overthrow capitalism. Get rid of it. And create a socialist paradise where everyone has the basic necessities, enough clothes, a house, enough food. Everyone has the basic necessities. Everyone has a job and everyone can live a decent life. That was the socialist message. And a lot of, uh, listen, tens of thousands of Oklahomans, especially in this part of the state, were sharecroppers. Uh, and that, uh, to, to, to say that that message resonated with them is an absolute uh under understatement. You know, this message appealed to Oklahoma tenant farmers who lived in these insect infected shacks who worked 18 hours a day on land that they would never own while, and their families struggled to make it. So in August of 1917, get this down, August of 1917, 900, this was a multicultural movement, 900 white and black and Native American sharecroppers right in this area and on back west toward Norman. Essentially in Kanawha, have you ever been to Kanawha? Kanawha, north of Ada, Kanawha, well, a few minutes north of Ada. That's where I did my practice teaching. Kanawha, uh, Seminole, Dewar, right up here at Dewar, you've been there. Uh, about 900 of these uh, farmers uh, decided to rise up, to rise up and overthrow the government. And they believed that if they rose up here, that socialists all over America would rise up and join into this revolution uh, and overthrow the government and capitalism. And they said, and then we're going to march to Washington, D.C., and we're going to stop the war. We're going to bring all of our soldiers home. And they announced in their meetings, you know, somebody must have gotten up and said, well, if 900 of us are going to do that, how are we going to eat? Uh, and of course, this is in the uh, this is in the uh, springtime, I believe. Yeah, well, late summer. Uh, they uh, were, they said we're going to uh, you know eat corn and uh, beef all the way. We'll just snatch cattle and slaughter them and eat them and corn. And uh, you know, uh, a lot of the corn was not yet ripe and ready to pick, uh, and so uh, they um, ate green corn. Okay, they ate green corn. And I suspect the only thing they got out of that is a severe case of the diarrhea. But this is called uh, the Green Corn Rebellion. Write that down, the Green Corn Rebellion. And it didn't last very long. It was all over in a matter of hours. There was an informer. There was someone who was pretending to be in the socialist movement, but at the same time, he was reporting all their plans to law enforcement. And so uh, when the day came and the signal was given for them to rise up and start this revolution that they sincerely believed would spread all across America, the law was ready for them. Uh, and of course, uh, the law began to arrest them. Some of them ran away and hid in the woods and they actually shot it out with law enforcement when law enforcement came in the woods to arrest them. Three were killed. 
450 people were arrested. Out of 450 people were arrested, 800, or excuse me, 86 uh, were sent to prison and they served anywhere from one to 10 years, okay? Uh, and this happening, I got this down, this happening, just as America's going to war, uh, gave socialism a bad name. Again, we're in this era of super patriotism. We've got to support the war. Uh, and here these guys are in Oklahoma rising up, trying to overthrow the government. It made them look like, it made socialists look like traitors. Plus in the same year, are you with me? Plus in the same year, the Russian revolution begins, and we're going to talk all about that, but the government of Russia was overthrown by the communists. The very first communist nation that ever existed uh, came into existence during uh, the World War I in 1917, and we'll talk all about that revolution, but it was a communist revolution, uh, and of course they created a new country, the communists did. Russia was no longer Russia. From 1917 until 1992, Russia, there was no Russia. It was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Republics. The USSR. You've, you've seen that acronym, haven't you? The USSR, okay. Well, uh, but look, this is what kills socialism uh, in Oklahoma and other places. Uh, the communists stole that. They absconded that. And, uh, you know, they said we're socialists. They were not. They were communists. And, and there's a difference between socialists and communists. I don't care if you don't like socialists. I'm not particularly fond. I mean, not socialist people. I'm sure they're fine people. Or, I don't care. But I dislike the precepts of socialism. It doesn't make them bad, evil people. I just disagree with them. Okay. Uh, but uh, one thing you... Sierra Wilkinson, please come to the office. One thing you must understand, there is a difference between socialism and communism, and the Russian Revolution blurred that difference. I dare say that most of the people in our state, or many people, the majority, I'll say, in our state, believe that if you say communist, it is the same as saying socialist. There's no difference, and there is a difference between communism and socialism. So uh, when this was all over and when the war was over and the communists had taken over Russia, the communists using the name of socialist had taken over Russia, uh, socialism became enormously unpopular in this country. It still is unpopular in this country. It became... Cindy Saxon, please come to the office for checkout. If you, if you ever run for office in Oklahoma and you can tag your opponent with the name socialist, you can convince him he's a dead duck and you're a winner. But we changed our flag after World War I, uh, and that's not it. We changed our flag to that uh, after World War I. Uh, and the new, flag, uh, the new flag that they have uh, uh, was adopted in 1925. Uh, seven years after the war ended. That's an Osage warrior shield with an olive branch and a peace pipe on a field of blue. But that's what did that. We said, we got to change it because this is too socialist. And in fact, by this time, they're saying this is too what? Communist, you know, red, the color of communist. This is, you know, Lenin led the Russian revolution. You'll find out all about him. The color of the communist in Russia was red. We said, we can't have that. So we, that guy didn't have anything to do with it. We well, it had something to do with it. Anyway, uh, write this down. When we come back, we're going to talk about a Supreme Court case, the case of Schink versus the United States. And it's all about socialism and your First Amendment rights.